Ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us. We're now going to begin the afternoon session, and it's a great pleasure. Uh, this is on the new global order, global dynamic, uh, and there's no one better to chair this session than uh, my good friend, uh, Mike Reed, from The Economist, who writes the, the Bello column uh, every week that I'm sure all of you read. And uh, let me turn it over to Mike Reed. Mike? Buenas tardes, boa tarde, bonjour, um, uh, good afternoon, hello. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here once again at the uh, Dialogue CAF conference um, to discuss uh, a, the, the, a very interesting and important topic that's on all our minds. Um, there were originally three questions in our, in our title. Uh, it's been reduced to two. So new global dynamic, a new global order, question mark. How does Latin America fit in? Because many of us might think that it's not clear that there's a new global dynamic. There's a, a great degree of global confusion. Um, is there a new global order or is there a global disorder or a global lack of order? from the Korean Peninsula to the Mexican border. Um, we are faced with, with many, many questions, I think. If we can try and provide one or two glimmers of an answer, then we would have been doing a service, I think. I want to just quickly set the scene um, uh, for this discussion. Um, I mean, it's clear that I think that the kind of comfortable assumptions that, that governed uh, uh, the world in, uh, for much of our lives, uh, those of us who are no longer as young as we would like to be, um, uh, have been overturned um, in, in the last uh, few years as a result of the cumulative consequences of globalization and technological change in ways that I think nobody really foresaw fully. Several things have been interacting over, over the last period. One is clearly the rise of the East. Uh, I mean, income per head in Asia since 1970 has increased fivefold, while in uh, the developed West it's barely shifted. Um, I think there's no doubt that the soft power and global standing of the West was affected by the financial crisis, affected by the Iraq war. And thirdly, um, the middle class, the middle classes in Europe and in the United States have been hollowed out to an extent over the last uh, 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 period. And we're seeing as a consequence of that um, a sense of frustration, uh, a sense of anger, and we're seeing the rise of populism. I mean, who would have thought and I wrote a column with this title earlier this year in The Economist, who would have thought that we would see a Peronist on the Potomac? But that is what we seem to have. Um, you add all this up, and there's a growing sense that the liberal global order that, broadly speaking, has been uh, in effect in the world since the Second World War, which involved uh, a rules-based system, even if those rules were sometimes violated, um, uh, involved open, open trade, uh, respect for human rights, democratization, and so on. All of that underpinned by this country, by the United States. Um, all of that now appears to be in retreat or in question. If we just take democratization, since 2008, according to Freedom House, which tracks these things, uh, uh, democracy has been in retreat in the world, not uh, no longer advancing. Political scientists used to consider that democratic consolidation was a one-way street. Uh, they're now starting to think that it's reversible. We look at the cases of Hungary, Turkey, Venezuela, to take just three. Um, so where does Latin America fit into such a, a world? 
Well, as uh, President Carranza has just uh, told us very eloquently, it's, uh, um, it's in, in recovering from a, a, a de an economic deceleration consequent upon the end of the commodity boom. Um, democracy has actually held up, Venezuela and Nicaragua apart, democracy has actually held up pretty well in, in Latin America compared with, say, Eastern Europe um, or Africa. Um, and, uh, but you have those uh, more middle class, more <coughs> demanding citizens that President Carranza <coughs> talked about are frustrated and need answers and the region needs to get back to faster growth. And one feels that the world is less helpful in that context than it was a few years ago. Certainly seen from Latin America, depends where you are within Latin America, but the Trump administration does not look very promising, let's say, in terms of what it, what it, what it offers to the region. Um, uh, the European Union is negotiating uh, a trade agreement with Mercosur, but the European Union remains uh, pretty introverted compared with a few years ago, pretty occupied with its own business, not just Brexit, its own uh, uh, internal business in the other members uh, of the Union. And Ch China is clearly here to stay in Latin America. It's become a very important player. I think lots of people have questions as to precisely uh, the implications of that uh, for the future. Um, and clearly Latin America needs to put its own house in order in terms of integration, but that is the subject of another panel. Um, so there is lots to try and grapple with, and we're lucky to have uh, a, a, a wonderful panel which spans the globe, in fact. Uh, Susana Malcora, uh, uh, former Foreign Minister of Argentina, former uh, uh, Chief of Staff to the UN, UN Secretary General, now in charge of organizing the World Trade Organization, uh, the next summit of the World Trade Organization. Um, then Pierre Pettigrew, um, former trade and finance minister from Canada um, in the private sector, but also special envoy for, for Prime Minister Trudeau for the Canadian uh, and uh, uh, EU trade agreement. Gabriela Ramos uh, is Mexican from the OECD. Um, in, in which uh, Latin America has a growing interest, then um, Lionel uh, Sansou, who is both French and Beninese. And he, he is a former prime minister of Benin, but he's also an investment banker and also uh, runs a think tank in France, uh, Terra Nova. Uh, and then we have Chris Olden, uh, who is a citizen of the world, I think, um, who now um, uh, operates uh, as the head of the Global South unit in, at the LSE. And then uh, finally, we have Wei Yao Wang, who, uh, uh, who is the president of the Center for China and Globalization, a former, he's an he's a academic, former govern, uh, government official, and now uh, it runs this think tank. So thank, thank you all for, for being here. Um, we have uh, an hour and a quarter, 75 minutes. There are six of you. So if you could try and uh, restrict your first, your opening remarks to about five minutes, that will allow time for us to, to create a dynamic, a new dynamic on the panel, which would be good, even if we can't do it in the world. So, Susanna, how does all this look to you? Thank you, Mike. And if I could answer all those questions in five minutes, I wouldn't be here for sure. <laughs> uh, thanks to the organizers for inviting us to participate. Uh, and it's, it's clear that the question that we are putting before all of us is, is a question that really is, uh, is war in the world and the leadership of the world. And I think there is a combination of factors. You talk about some of them. The challenges of globalization, the tensions between globalization and, 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 and technological breakthroughs that really put a pressure on, on people, on people's jobs, on, on, on hope about the future. All those things bring a, 
a, a strong questioning on the leadership, the political leadership in particular, but not only, also, I will say, the business leadership in the world. So that's one piece of information that one needs to take into account when uh, evaluating what the situation of, of the world is today. The other aspect is what has happened after the Berlin Wall fell, and we went from a bipolar world with a, a, some understanding of the space each one of the sides was taking, and particularly how each one of the sides was aligning its troops to make sure that things were played within a certain realm. That went away with the fall of the Berlin Wall, and we went into a unipolar state uh, where the US was essentially leading. And then it came a, a, the 2008 crisis that put things in, in a very, very complicated setting with the rise of China somehow challenging this, this unipolar space. On top of this, there, were the, there are the challenges brought by terrorism, by all the isms that are there that do not recognize uh, powers as such and that really defy the order that we seem to have, even though it may be a disorder. All of this puts into question the fundamental basis of what has been our understanding of how we operate based on the principles you describe, uh, Mike, that are enshrined in the Charter of the United Nations. And I think somehow what we are facing here is the fact that those principles that were so well understood, so much shared by the leadership and by the generations that face World War II are not there any longer as they were understood. And the notion that the powers that are playing their role today do not represent any longer what the societies are, are clearly at the heart of what is it that we are having as a crisis. And this is not only the fact that we have 193 nations in the United Nations that are a huge growth from that beginning where Latin America by the world play a key role in the foundational process of the United Nations, but also means that getting decisions from those 193 is even more difficult today than it was 20 years ago. That you have a Security Council where the, the, power, the veto power that was enshrined in the fighters that came out of of the World War II do not again represent the distribution of power today. The notion that most of the challenges that we have today, be that terrorism, extremism, a, you know, health hazards like we have seen with Ebola, a climate change, all those things respect no boundaries and we have organizations based on a member states and their sovereign space there is a, a mismatch there between the basics of those organizations and the realities we face. The fact that most people are moving into cities, that the problems we have are <coughs> urban problems for most part of our citizens, and cities are not essentially represented in these schemes. All of this shows that the, the crisis we are facing is larger than just thinking about what is happening today because there is an election process in one country or another. And I will pose before you that we need to think about a renaissance of the multilateral system, a renaissance that recognizes that these different realities have evolved and that we need to find a new construct that allows us to think about a future where it still makes sense to work together and to find solutions in a with a collective mindset. 
Do, do I see this happening anytime soon? I'm afraid not, because the mood is not there. But we need to find ways to buy time in order to, for, for the leadership of the world to move into this new thinking. Otherwise, the risk of not having anything to address the challenges that we collectively ha have are too high, and I think is a, the humankind has learned enough not to let this happen. I will leave it there. I hope you're right on, the, on your last point. <laughs> um, Pierre, is there a new global order? Is there a new liberal order? Global order. Global. Oh, uh, oh thank you, Michael. Um, listen, I, I don't think there is one now. I, I do believe we are in an era of uh, t grand transformation. And uh, I think 2016 is the years for the historians. It will be marked on the calendars. Between Brexit and Trump, we all the elites got it wrong. Business elites as well as the political elites and the media. And between Brexit and Trump, uh, uh, that both came with a shock. Uh, we arrived a few months into it, and I've seen other countries stepping up. I mean, uh, Germany seems to be stepping up. France has voted for the first time ever in the center with uh, 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 Macron. Uh, and so in, in, in my view, at this time, when people ask me, is there a new global order as you just do, I say from, a, from an economic point of view, if you ask me, is there a future to globalization, I would always say uh, technology has supported globalization more than the politicians. Uh, technology will continue to support globalization. And then when we look at the economies around the world, as um, Luis Carranza demonstrated so well, uh, <coughs> when globalization has eliminated maybe a billion people around the planet, there are a lot of countries that would demand to continue on globalization. So President Trump might have his doubts, and he may not like globalists. And uh, I look at what's going on in Britain at this time. You, are, you, you would know more than I do. But after the Brexit decision, I have only seen confusion. I have the impression the, the Brits have no idea whatsoever of what they, were to go, where they want to go. So uh, my view is that the, on the economic point of view, because, uh, because of the number of countries that have benefited of globalization, and because technology is at the center of the, the, that, that, that will continue. Now, is there a political global order that will go in that direction? That is a, a bigger challenge. And one of the reasons is precisely that for 30 years, globalization has, uh, with the emergence of so many countries, we have far more diffused power. There's been a huge diffusion of power. I mean, 50 years ago, the United States could run the world. They could not today. Because, because the, world, the, the world economy has allowed so many other people to do well, and politics, in the end, reflects the economics. So I think that from an economic point of view, uh, the, 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 the Brexit and Trump thing will will be little chattering around it. Uh, it, 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 it is going to continue. On the political uh, order, how can we reorganize the world? That will be a bigger challenge. Uh, I, I have no idea what the Brits want to do. I, and I don't think they themselves know. I found them, as a Canadian, I loved having the Brits in the European Union because they were so pro-market and they could make a European Union that was very much open to the rest of the world, trade stuff and this kind of thing. So we lose within the European Union and then gin in favor of trade. Where will they use their influence? I don't see it. It is not obvious, particularly that the, I don't see where the country is going. And I don't know where the United States will go either. Um, this is a country that has, uh, at this moment, um, uh, a, a great deal of confusion around where the country wants to go. The, 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 because, I mean, even the White House itself says different things. I mean, beyond the president, you have a divided White House. Uh, 
uh, we know people keep saying the Americans are divided, Americans are divided, Americans are divided. They've always been divided. That's not the issue. The problem now is that Republicans are divided. Uh, that, that is the real problem, is that the uh, party that controls so much of, of, of the American politics is itself uh, very divided. So Latin America in, in all of this, if you, you know, if you, if you look at the reality uh, in, in Asia, and we talk a great deal these days about North Korea, if you look at the Middle East, and if you look at all of the tension, the, the tensions we have challenging this global order, uh, Latin America is an oasis of peace. This is an oasis of peace. We bring a great deal in the Americas, all of the Americas, include Canada, uh, uh, United States, and Mexico into this, as, as a great contribution to world stability as far as politics is concerned. Uh, I do believe a great deal in our destiny as a country. I can tell you that one thing I'm the, very proud of is that when we've had the, the whole uh, NAFTA situation uh, in Canada, no one uh, doubted how important it was that we work with the Mexicans this particular challenge around the NAFTA renegotiation. Nobody said, well, listen, President Trump is focused on their deficit. Let's focus on, you know, Canada, U.S. People in Canada and the foreign minister said it in a way, you know, it was very clear, uh, Canada will not throw the Mexicans under the bus. And uh, I believe very much that there's a great deal of solidarity on that front, <laughs> that Latin America can uh, certainly, and uh, President Carranza demonstrated very well, all of the work we have to do in, in the Americas on governance and reducing inequality, that is a big challenge and this and that. But this remains uh, the hemisphere where you want to be in the next uh, decade or so. Um, well, that's great to have a bit of optimism. <laughs> um, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Pierre. Let me just say on Brexit, I mean, uh, I completely agree with you. I, I, I think for me as a, as a Brit, uh, I kind of did see Trump coming. I didn't see Brexit coming because it, it is clearly a decision that is going to cause uh, a lot of uh, economic damage to the country. Uh, those who voted for it, I think the kind of thing that ought to give us pause is that I think quite a lot of those who voted for it actually, in theory, were prepared to pay that economic price um, because they saw it as, a, uh, as about national sovereignty, about, about regaining control over their lives and environment. I think they're wrong. But I mean, um, and we, we will see how it plays out. But it, that is something that really ought to give us pause, those of us who are Democrats, you know, as to how that can come about. Um, Gabriella, um, <coughs> the OECD um, uh, no longer really, its members, with a few exceptions, are no, really, uh, are no longer really the most dynamic part of the global economy, I think it's fair to say. Um, how, how, how do you see the world from, from that uh, headquarters in Paris? Well, uh, thank you for the invitation. And uh, I, I, I'm very glad to join forces with this uh, group of people. Uh, because yes, the OECD is moving towards Latin America. <laughs> we have actually Argentina, uh, Brazil, and uh, Peru who have requested membership. Uh, we are in the process of uh, Colombia and Costa Rica joining, and we have Mexico and Chile as members, so I think we're pretty well represented. Uh, I wish I could buy what uh, you and Pierre have said. I, I, I think it's more complex than that. I think that uh, we have been focusing for long, uh, the OECD and, and many countries in Latin America, to build a, a, a macro uh, infrastructure that is open to trade and investment without looking at the homework that you need to do for making that kind of globalization and global integration work for everybody. And at the OECD, we have been documenting the increased inequalities of income and opportunities of the most advanced countries in the world. We're not talking about Latin America where we know that we're the champions of inequality and the, the champions of informality and the champions, I mean, big economies, very well-developed economies, I would not uh, uh, um, uh, deny that there had been 
progress and, and many benefits in terms of the openness and the open regimes that we have built. But the reality is that it has not delivered for everybody. Uh, and what you are seeing in Europe, I mean, the fact that in France you have 40% of the population voting for the extremes, whatever extreme you want to call it, but anti-establishment, is because they see that, well, great, that's a great party, but I'm not in, and I'm not getting what I'm supposed to be getting. Um, is 40% of the population that have been left behind in the OECD countries. The bottom 40, we call it. If you think about the relationship between the top 10% with the bottom 10%, now it's uh, 10 times. And these are countries with, with very well-developed social safety nets. Uh, if you think about wealth, it's 70 times. If you think about wealth concentration at the top of the income distribution, the 10% or the 1%, is 40, 20%. I mean, it's just, it's just a staggering. And in the financialization of our economies, of course, those that have access to financial instruments get this growing, and then you get the Piketty effect. So I think that we need to be very serious, not at saying what are the proposals that we have at the table to address this backlash of the societies to the growth model that we have followed, uh, but really how we can develop a growth model that delivers for people. <laughs> We used to, in, in, in Mexico, and I'm, I'm deferring to Madame Hills, uh, we always thought, let's just open up and it will fix everything. So we ask trade and investment openness to do everything. They can't. They do something. And I think they get market signals right. They get price signals right. They get consumer choices. They get competition. Those things are good. But if you don't build infrastructure, in terms of having the skills, or in terms of having integrated labor markets, in terms of having institutional settings that promote growth, in terms of having an effective state, effective rules, someone that ensures the rule of law, these things do not trickle down. And that's what we're seeing. We just focus on opening up, which is fine. I would not say, let's just uh, uh, turn it away. Uh, but these other policies, as it, and it's not complementary policies. When I hear, oh yes, a complementary, no, it's the growth model. It's a development path that includes the opening of the economy, which is fine, but that it really needs to build up all the capacities for these economies to continue growing. And I think that's a challenge that we are now. I think that 10 years after the crisis, uh, the mood is not good. Of course it's not good because on top of it, we have had 10 years of very slow growth. We have 10 years in which we got a little bit of a recovery moving back. Uh, it's true, trade has retrenched. Uh, we had for five years uh, the growth of the trade, uh, uh, half of the GDP. It used to be twice or three times GDP growth. That was a relationship of trade growth. It's not the same. We had had the expansion of global value chains for the first time uh, last year there was a retrenchment. So the foreign content of exports and imports were lower than was uh, before. So these things are happening. Now I think we're going pendular. Now we're going to blame everything on trade. And now we <coughs> need to close borders. And now we need to, and, and I think that we need to have a much more serious discussion on how to make trade work for everybody. But I don't think that the solution is to close the borders. I don't think that the solution is to balance trade because, because the problem is that that really blurs how we are interlinked, how this process of opening had made our economy so interlinked. And this was uh, one of the outcomes of the crisis. I remember I was, I, I live in Paris and, and they pay me hardship because, you know, Paris, I'm sorry, it's a it, very, it very hardship. bad city. Uh, but, you speak French. <laughs> but the point is that they were saying, oh, this is, this is a U.S. problem. Oh, yes, this, pro this Americans, I mean, they just bought houses that they would never pay. We, we're fine, thank you. Gosh, I mean, all these linkages of the financial sector, there was not an American problem. And then we said, okay, the emerging economies are going to sustain growth because they're very strong. No, there had been a really slowdown everywhere because they need this dynamic uh, power that, that the advanced economies had. So, so this is where we stand and that the OECD, we are trying to uh, develop this agenda of a more inclusive growth, which means how do you decide on policies that will really take into account the impact that they have of the bottom of the income distribution, 40% of the population. Because on top, uh, general policies have different impact 
in different income groups. And if we don't focus on youth and those that don't have access to uh, work or uh, education, if we don't focus on uh, reducing informality, if we don't focus on skills, if we don't focus also in trying to uh, have access to broadband, Latin America is only 50% coverage, and then you have these disparities in regional disparities where one region, in, for example, in Mexico has almost 70% uh, broadband access, and another region has 30%. So all these elements, the enabling elements that you need to continue growing need to be there. Uh, but I agree, it's, it's getting very complex because now we went pendular and we think that we should just blame the open trade and investment regime about everything. We're happy to see that Latin America, or at least the major economies in Latin America, are not betting on that. I think that uh, the, we are very encouraged by what we see has been this rapprochement with the OECD, and where what Argentina and, and, and Brazil and, and Peru say, they, they, they just want to be in the house, as uh, President Bachelet uh, called us, of, of good practices. And they want to learn from those good practices to build a more inclusive uh, development process for, for their countries. So, Thank you very much no, I mean, for pointing to a lot of big challenges that, that um, we all face. Um, Lionel Zinzu, how does this world look from Africa? Maybe, is it? Yeah. Okay, so what you have missed was just me thanking everybody for the invitation. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for inviting a bit of Africa through me. I would say, seen from Africa, we are absolutely convinced that there is a new global dynamic. And the reason is that we are the proof, because we are joining this order. We were totally absent. When the previous order was built, be it in uh, Bretton Woods, San Francisco, New York. I mean, post-war, there were two independent states in Africa. So yes, Liberia and Ethiopia uh, contributed. We were the 53 other <coughs> sovereign states of today, just not there. We were not born as sovereign states. And even more recently, when you were attending some uh, important conferences for, on climate, for instance, the silence of Africa was really something, I mean, spectacular and frightening. I mean, in Rio, even in Durban in Africa, you may remember when uh, President Chirac said, uh, our house is burning. Notre maison brûle, a sort of dramatic, uh, uh, spectacular statement, it was in Durban. The voice of Africa was not heard, not in Copenhagen. On the Kyoto, in, in the Kyoto conference, in the Kyoto protocol, where funds were put in place, uh, the carbon fund, in order to facilitate funding uh, of all the anti-climate change <laughs> evolutions, where Africa is a very vulnerable part of the world, maybe the most impacted by current climate changes. We didn't consume the credits. They only went to emerging countries because our capacity of absorbing aid uh, on everything about environment, but it's true of economic development, or absorption capacity was not there. All that is changing. So in terms of dynamics, I think the dynamic of change is, is quite visible. In the COP21 conference in Paris, without the 55 votes, 54 votes, of African Union countries, it would not have been a success. But Africa acted uh, under leadership of uh, the African Union and uh, of President Alpha Conde of Guinea, um, 
for the first time in a consistent way and expressed uh, claims. Um, was a complex move with Egypt playing an important role and uh, the African Union and so, and so on. But what was very striking was we can listen to Africa and there is a position of Africa. And when you consider what has been confirmed in COP22 in African uh, land in Marrakech, the funding for an electricity of power revolution in Africa has been complemented after this initi the initiatives of uh, the USA, uh, uh, Power Africa, the UK, European Union, but clearly it has been complemented uh, during those two conferences. And for the first time, I thought, in my lifetime, uh, the voice of Africa was significant and listened to and heard. So I would say, yes, there is a new dynamic because we joined this club. Second, is it a new global order or disorder? Uh, the crisis and the disorders create institutions to try and resolve them. When the G20 has been created at the level of the heads of state uh, in autumn 2008, uh, Africa joined the club for the first time. And you, you will observe that in any uh, G7, G20 meeting today, beyond South Africa, which is our uh, ambassador in the G20, you have always invited, you see, uh, the President of the African Union, which is a strengthening organization. You see the head of uh, the chair of the, the African Development Bank and a selection of heads of state of Africa because Africa start to be needed uh, to, to consider how to resolve uh, the, the, the disorder. So we, we participate and we have the feeling, which is a very new feeling, that we are gaining a sort of legitimacy to participate in this order. And it's quite natural because we, we have a, a capacity to create more disorder or to resolve a bit of the disorder. In migration terms, which is an obsession of the Europeans, in migration policy, uh, if we do not cooperate, it will be more complex to try and master the issue. And the issue is so important uh, uh, in Europe uh, for, for policy making. If we decided to develop a business model, a, a, a development model, as in the OECD countries or in China, we would make the planet something absolutely out of control. Just imagine that in our growth, which is the second highest growth in the last 15 years after Asia, just imagine that we put the same content of coal, of carbon emissions, of uh, I mean, whatever would replicate the previous growth experience, then we would make life of the planet more difficult. But we can also help to reduce some of the, um, the disorders. Same for the terrorism. Same for uh, organized crime. One of the links which has developed a lot in between Africa and Latin America is drug trafficking. And we have to address the problems as they are. Uh, if we do not cooperate, it will be a, a dramatic uh, evolution. Because frag fragile states can help organized crime a lot. So, so strengthening those states is key and key for uh, the relationships with all uh, continents. So how does Latin America fit in for us, it becomes very important to know. And, and we observe Latin America a lot because we consider that we have, in building our own model of development, we have to learn a lot of global south uh, experiences. And we are more and more interested. And you see more and more uh, former president of Latin America lecturing in Africa, participating in, in forums, 
just because we have a desire and a curiosity of Latin America, very, very, very much so. There is nothing more pertinent for us, Mr. President, than the cap or the <laughs> American bank experience or the BNDES uh, style of panoply of arms for development. So it's more and more pertinent for us. But, and I will finish with that, you cannot be very strong in a global system if you are not strong at home. So what I think explains that we start to be part of the international order is that in terms of demographics, we are st the strongest power. Is it a weakness? Is it a strength? But we are the, 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 the strongest and the fastest. In terms of middle class building, we have the same figures as the ones you have shown, except that they are a bit higher and a bit faster in terms of building the middle class. Because we will be the only continent being not 1.1 billion as today, but 2.2 in just 25 years. The only one. We will be also the only one with 500 million more urban citizens in 20 years. So we start to have some first positions, which means that we buy a position in the new order. Uh, it's difficult to ignore Africa. And, uh, and in, in this respect, we have to understand how to share experience. And, and namely, I mean, we love OECD because OECD is more and more Latin American, Asian, and over time will become a bit African. The, the, the world cannot be only ruled by the oldest and the declining powers. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, how do we fit in? Uh, I don't know, but what I know is that I'm curious of how Latin America fits in <laughs> because it's relevant for me. <laughs> Very good. Well, there's a challenge. Um, and a very refreshing perspective, which I'm sure we're, we'll hear more of. Um, Chris Holden, we've just heard from part of the Global South. I have a question. I mean, when pe people talk about the Global South, is it actually a coherent analytical unit? I mean, it meets from time to time in the BRICS, in IBSA, etc. cetera. Um, there are development banks. But do you see a, the Global South as being able to be a key player in the construction of a new global order? I think it's a, both a key and a necessary player. Without the global south, as my colleagues and colleagues have spoken to, you, uh, there is no global order. The absence of that voice, the absence of strong institutions rooted in the practices uh, and background of the developing world, as it's been called in the past, or third world in a previous era, that is necessary to the construction of this new, of engaging this new order, of building that new order. And it's not just a point of rhetoric here. I think it's a practical point. It's, as, as was said a moment ago, when it comes to solving problems, global, transnational global issues, to think of solving them without inclusive uh, in, involvement of countries from around the, the uh, um, uh, globe in a globalized setting that we do live in, is, is, uh, is a non-starter. We have to have all these actors involved, the institutions, the, the, be they state-based, be they regional organizations, the, and, 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 uh, uh, and for that matter, multilateral institutions. What is interesting to me, and it comes out in our discussions here, is that it's not just a multipolarity that we're speaking to, the, but we're talking about a multipolarity of ideas. There's a new marketplace for ideas of what constitutes development, how you get there, uh, it's, it's much more uh, fast speed, slow speed. It has different, different dimensions, different sets of ideas. To speak to your, to your last point, it's no longer coming just from the experiences of the industrialized, developed world. It's coming from the experience of uh, the recent experiences of, of countries that themselves went through development. And that has changed the dynamic of what it is uh, countries who, that are seeking to move forward can do. They can look to China. They can look to experiences within the African continent. They can look across uh, uh, 
to Southeast Asia. These all open up that, that marketplace. No longer is, are the institutions in command of, of knowledge, as it were. Uh, and, and I think that that's what's exciting for us. There's also a difference in terms of, of delivery of development. Development can be delivered in different ways now. It's not just a donor-recipient sort of relationship. It's a relationship where the rhetoric of, of, of uh, transfer of, of technology uh, is, is given real expression through cooperative investments. Uh, we see partnership programs, trilateral cooperation. It's a bigger menu, not just in terms of ideas, but in terms of delivery. That's that inclusion in the development process that, that the Global South has not, not only necessitates, but enables. And I think that, that dialogue has created a kind of leveling in the development sphere that was not there before. It was always uh, fundamentally paternalistic <coughs> in the way it was presented. So I find that particularly exciting. And I know it's, there, there are many things we've talked about that can be one can be pessimistic about, but I think it's important to cast that spotlight on, on this dimension, which to my mind holds great promise for Latin America, for Africa, for, for Asia, and the like. Um, where, where are we going to get, in, in a marketplace of new ideas, where do we look to? And I think we look to institutions. If the political uh, constellation of power is shifting or changing, regional organizations, I mean, dare I say universities, all of we are the ones who engage in these ideas, this thinking. We're the ones that are globalized by definition. We're the ones who know, uh, have our finger on the pulse in some sense. And I think that this is where, it's, this is how uh, um, the new world is going to be shaped. The values of accountability, transparency, they're, they're promoted through academic institutions, through regional organizations. Uh, banks as well, and, and this is important in terms of our practices and how we are going to reshape this. You will know that, that, that there is a BRICS, there's been a BRICS uh, conference now, uh, most recently summit, and with that there is a concurrent discussion about, um, about how to do development between BRICS countries. These are new ideas, new developments that will impact upon uh, and introduce, I, I believe, ultimately, over the long term, a kind of stability to the international system and a harmony to that system. I'll leave it at that. So, the prospect of a new stability. Um, Wang Wei Yao, um, uh, the last shall be first, as the Bible says. Um, uh, earlier this year, we all watched uh, or saw President Xi at Davos defend globalization and uh, free trade and trade, yeah? Um, what kind of global order does China want and uh, how close do you think you are to getting it? Thank you, thank you. And uh, I think this is a truly a global panel and, uh, from all continents and uh, I'm really impressed and, and join every, everybody speak. Uh, thank organizer for inviting me. I think this is really a, a great uh, a conference that has been running for 21 years, and uh, so it shows how uh, Latin American countries, uh, you know, attach the importance of, the, of the globalization. I, I think the, uh, as you said, uh, the, the President Xi gave a, a, a famous talk at Davos at the beginning of this year. So, so China is embracing globalization basically. So the globalization is uh, at a crossroad at the juncture that we're having uh, challenges. We're not saying we're creating a new global order, but I think the existing global order is facing challenges, and uh, if, if not going to be fixed or going to be enhanced, strengthened, I think then the, the, the global is, we're having a lot of problems. I think the globalization, the trend, as we have heard from the panelists, the trend is continuing. The, the big momentum is continuing. That is no turning around. I mean, I could give you examples of, of, of China. For example, we have 100 million people touring around the world every year. That's not happened 10 years, 20 years ago. That's a globalization. And Five million Chinese students study abroad. That has been, never happened before. And uh, of course, just between you know, uh, North America and, and China, on a daily, there's hundreds of flights, 20 to 30 people crossing the Pacific every day. So, so you see, I, I think the, uh, the uh, you know, from the economic trade, you know, from the uh, 
uh, migration from the, uh, the, uh, the capital flow, talent flow, uh, trade flows. Globalization is going to con con certainly going to stay. But the challenge is that we are now running out of the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the momentum for the good order. That's I can see because uh, uh, particularly last year, as we have heard, uh, that uh, we've seen uh, the, the, the surprises on the, on, on, uh, that everyone is taking for granted that globalization is going to be uh, 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 you know, a given fact, but it's not. We are, we are having setbacks of globalization, right? We have, we have BRICS, we have, uh, we have Donald Trump, American first, and uh, you know, global maybe second or third. So, so that's, that's something, you know, the, uh, the, the uh, news channel. So I'm very pleased to see that at this time, that China can put forward, say, let's stick to globalization, let's, you know, still support globalization, let's have the globalization idea and uh, maintain the globalization. And that's something, you know, if, if, uh, if at this confusing moment, if at this uh, uh, challenging moment, if you hear from a country like China to say, hey, look, let's <laughs> stick to the globalization. So that's a good, good message to say, to, to, to say by President Xi, I think. So, so that's for that. But then, in order how to enhance the globalization, I think in, in light of the, uh, the conference we have here and, uh, and uh, uh, you know, what, what can be done to enhance the globalization, you know, in addition to WTO, which is great. I mean, uh, we, we're having WTO uh, 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 is doing so well, IMF, World Bank, you know, all those institutions are, are still doing well, but I think we need to add new momentum to that. And, uh, so, so what I'm saying is that we have G20 now just, the, the BRICS summit just, just finished in Beijing. We had the president of Brazil, president of Mexico coming to China. We, we, had, we had the BRICS plus now. So five BRICS country plus another five countries. So the BRICS plus, the BRICS country plus a concept is going to probably going to have more, more influence uh, probably in the future. But I think there's more can be done. For example, we had the TPP, Donald Trump said, uh, let's, you know, pull another TPP the first day he's in the White House, right? So, for the Asia Pacific countries, I mean that's the huge amount of uh, trade and, and, and good flows, investment flows. We need more, you know, good order or maybe good governance structure for that. So if TPP is not really going well, I, I think that there's there's an Asia Pacific Free Trade Agreement, which is FTAP. I think that probably we should really work on that. You know, we we still need a good uh, global order for that and then try to have some global governance and then to facilitate that. So, so I think, you know, that probably is, a, is really a, a, a new, new, new objective, new globalization that we need to really push forward. And uh, so, so I think that's really uh, the, the thing. Uh, uh, the other, on the other side, I, I see that there's a lot of new things coming out of China that could be shared with the other uh, countries, like other American countries. For example, you have uh, uh, the e-commerce, e which is uh, you know flourishing in China, you have uh, those uh, mobile payment. China become a cashless society now. You just carry a mobile phone. You go anywhere. You don't need the cash. You don't need your wallet. Just just a, a mobile. Phone. So so there's no new innovation like the high speed train, like the infrastructure. Those those new globalization supporting roles or supporting infrastructure that China can really probably. Uh, Collaborating with those countries to, uh, to, 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 to continue to support the globalization or, or the or new global order for that. And I think that, uh, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the, uh, so we need some more mechanism, more, more dialogues, more, more conference, more like this to really exchange ideas and stimulating the new, new thinking to really sustain that. And uh, so, uh, for example, also China used to be a, a country of bikes. And then for, 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 for the last uh, 20 years, since, uh, 15 years since China joined WTO, China became the largest auto, auto market in the world. You know? And then there's no more bikes. Certainly, recent two years, the bikes come back. There's 100 million new bikes that are shared. You, you just use your mobile phone uh, to, to swipe on your bike, and then you can just ride it anywhere in the cities. So there's a shared economy is, is flourishing. So those kind of new... Uh, inventions, new uh, technology, I think, can be shared to other countries. Uh, based on China's po population, such a big sample, 1.4 billion people, that have, you have 80% of penetration of mobile phone, mobile uh, smartphones, and, uh, and, uh, and also those uh, mobile technology that can be used 
uh, elsewhere, and also high-speed train uh, that generated out of China because of a large geography and a large market to have this kind of technology. So I think there's more to be done. And finally, I want to say a bit about the uh, China-Latin American collaboration. I think China and Latin America are really uh, economic-wise uh, supplementary, and also uh, many are in the same development stage. There's a lot of experience that Latin American can benefit China, and China can benef benefit Latin American countries as well. Uh, for example, for in the last decade, uh, uh, China's trade with uh, investment with, with, with Latin American countries is over $100 billion. Just last year, there's, 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 there's a $30 billion Chinese investment into, into Latin American countries. And the bilateral trade between Latin American countries and China is over 200 billion uh, uh, you know, <laughs> every year. So, so I see there's a huge potential between Latin American countries and China. So, so, so my, my final observation is that uh, you know, the conference is great and I'm pleased to be here, <laughs> and, uh, but I think that China can really uh, help to maintain the globalization, the, 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 the order. The, the dynamic is still there, of course, it's, it's very strong, but the order needs to be maintained, needs to be strengthened, and needs to be add new momentum. And then China can really play that role to add new momentum, to add new support, and then we, we don't have a globalization turning backward. So that's my uh, comment. Thank you. So globalization is not dead, but it is changing. And, um, uh, that's, and we have to be very aware of that. Well, you've all been extremely orderly in your use of time, for which I thank you, so that we actually now have some time for questions. It's been a lot to digest. There's, it was a very rich um, uh, discussion. Um, so I assume there are some microphones either. Um, so stick your hand up. Um, I cannot believe that, yeah, two over here, please. Please, could you identify yourself and indicate if your question is for anybody in particular, if it is, yeah. Thank you. My name is Marta Lagos from Latino Barometro Chile. I was wondering whether, or maybe my question would be, um, it's not, is it not there an enormous contradiction between these the fact that Trump election and Brexit showed us that people define their worldview in as much as they consider their own experience. It is the network that surrounds people that determines the vote. It is not the worldview. It is not by far not what's beyond the borders, not even what's in the next city. So is, is it not terrible to be talking about globalization in a very intellectual matter way and at the same time not considering the fact that the people who are suffering or benefiting from globalization are defining themselves within their own surroundings? And uh, I think that, you know, if we need to put that into the equation. Is it not the fact that this is part of the problem uh, that we're facing. Okay, thank you very much. I'll, let's take a, a few and then um, uh, over there. Um, over here? No, 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 over there. Uh. Yes, hello, my name is Alejandro Lara. I'm currently uh, working on a research study at uh, Georgetown University um, in the capacity building targeting uh, youth, youth development throughout Latin America. Um, the question, my spe the specific question, actually, I, I would like to go around the, the panel to, if you could please, each of you, uh, uh, if you have a power to, let, let's assume for a second that every single country in Latin America is for sale, and you have the power, the economic power, to, to buy two specific countries. Uh, which, which one of the two would you buy? And why? You know, assuming that you already did a, a through assessment, a political, social, economic assessment of each particular country. So I would like to know if, from each of you, since you know we are very well uh, represented from Africa, China, Canada, Mexico, and Argentina, and uh, the and the Brits also represented. So. I would like to know, 
which, which one of the two would you buy and why? Thank you. Um, Susanna Marquardt just told me she didn't understand the question. Is the question if, if this was a kind of board game and um, you could uh, choose to buy any particular country in Latin America, which country would you buy? Yes, buy and why? Why are you investing specifically in, this, in these two particular countries? Not just, to just not to say one of them, but just please just choose two of them. Thank you. There is, a, there is a rather good book by a Harvard philosopher, Michael Sandel, called What Money Cannot Buy. But anyway, let's... let's um, <laughs> but I, I take your question to be a roundabout way of saying uh, which country has the best prospects in, 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 in Latin America. Um, over here, and then over here, and um, over here. Thank you. Um, my name is Dr. Alvaro Mendez from the London School of Economics. Michael, you, you started to talk about China. You said that China is not going away. And we ended up talking about China as well with the panel. So my question is about China in many ways, and, and specifically what, um, for everyone, but specifically for you as well, what, what do you see as the new role of China and Latin America in the new Silk Road? Uh, taking into account that you have six Latin American countries that are now uh, candidates to be members of the AAIB, uh, including Argentina, by the way, the latest one. That's it. Thank you. We are not candidates. Okay. Um, over here, uh, there's, there's two in a row. So why don't you? Um, Thank you. Um, Evan Ellis, the U.S. Army War College. My question is, is actually uh, for, for, uh, for, for Mr. Wong. Um, as you know, uh, during the past decade, we've seen not only expanding trade between China and Latin America, but also a, a transformation from largely trade to investment and Chinese companies increasingly having a presence on the ground. Of course, with that, that makes uh, Chinese companies uh, both impacting the communities as, as employers and also impacted by the conditions in those companies. So as China makes that transformation to being part of Latin America and not just trading with it, um, how does China, how does the Chinese government exercise its power to protect its investments, to protect its workers? How does it change the way it relates to Latin America um, as, as a part of the region which is impacted by it? without violating the, the principle that China's long professed um, of, of respect for the, the sovereignty and decisions of those countries. Okay, thank you. Um, just your neighbor. Thank you. I'm Carl Dahlman from the Growth Dialogue, and I'm actually from Colombia. So I want to say one of the concerns I have in, in hearing the presentation, we hear there is a change in global order, but it's not at all clear where Latin America fits into the global order. And my concern is that we're sort of being left out, that we're not ready, we heard about the importance of focusing on productivity and making a compact, but nothing about how we're going to do that. Because you look at the rest of the world, it's moving very quickly. It's getting very complex. There is not enough integration. There's not a, a coherent view across Latin American countries. Other regions are much more coherent. We're not. So we're missing the boat. And I think that's a challenge for us for the conference. So it's not just a question to the speakers, although any question that you want to react to, that would be good. But I think that in this conference, it would be good if we try to come to grips what kinds of concrete initiatives can be undertaken to help Latin America do better in this very demanding global context? Yeah, very good. Um, any questions over here? Right, well, um, there's one over here, and then let's go to the panel. Thank you. My name is Cristina Rodriguez Acosta from uh, Miami, Florida. Um, I have a, a quick comment and maybe a reaction from, from you. Um, we have talked about Latin America fitting in this new world, but I haven't heard enough about the importance of strengthening democratic institutions and, uh, and reforming those institutions. So which area would you uh, emphasize? Do we have to strengthen the judicial system? Uh, do we need to strengthen citizen participation? What would be a key area of strengthening so we have a, a more strengthened democracy in uh, our hemisphere? Thank you. Okay, many thanks. Let's do this in reverse order, and that way Latin America gets the last word. Um, so, uh, um, Wang Huiyao, uh, there are several questions for you there. Okay, thank you. <coughs> thank you. Uh, all those are very good questions. I think uh, 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 one of the first questions about uh, uh, Trump's uh, domestic politics versus international globalization. I think that uh, you know uh, any domestic in, uh, politics is international politics, and international politics is domestic politics. 
So in the short term, maybe domestic taking more attention, but in the long run, I think domestic, international politics can affect domestic politics. So we already seen that uh, you know uh, Ther Theresa May. I mean, when, have, when she has a second <laughs> election, uh, then then the Brexit uh, forces are getting smaller. So so I'm sure the Donald Trump will, will probably facing some challenges uh, once the globalization. If if it's the globalization is getting too strong, globalization will have a comeback. So so that's my observation. And then. Talking about the countries, uh, which one uh, uh, likes the public be better? I, personally, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I found maybe Brazil could be, a, uh, because it geographically is bigger and the, uh, there's a lot of la land still un undeveloped, there's a still a lot of potential. So uh, size-wise and, uh, and potential-wise could be a, a big uh, economic uh, emerging power in the, in the future. So, so I think it has a lot of uh, potential there. And then uh, for the uh, question about Chinese investment in Latin America, I think uh, that's right. I mean, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a lot of trade, and it's also continue to, to do investment. And uh, I, I think Chinese companies are learning as well. It's getting to do more uh, social, uh, corporate social responsibilities and trying to abide by local laws, uh, hire local employees, and then to learn that. So, uh, so, so it's, there's a learning curve. But definitely, I, I think, you know, eventually, uh, there's going to be a, a integration and probably a smooth transition there. And, uh, and finally, of course, uh, I think on a new global uh, challenges, a new, new global impetus that China can add, AIB was a good example. I mean, the, so we have a one more uh, international lending institution that, that, that focus on the infrastructure project, which is really important. And then finally, I think, uh, I think the, uh, this year we had this uh, uh, one by one road, you know, the OBOR summit in, in Beijing, which we had uh, 30 heads of the countries, uh, <laughs> states came to China, 50 international organization heads of uh, coming to China, and over 130 countries' representatives. So, so it's kind of a, a new initiative. I'm not saying it's a new order, but it's a new initiative to really strengthen the existing globalization. So I think. Uh, uh, one by one road is really, uh, uh, it's involving, it, it's not a China project, it's a global project that can, can stir up the, the excitement of the, of the new investment and for the, of the new opportunities, which can really uh, spread the, uh, the prosperity, you know, uh, and some of the China experience to others, and also at the same time to create a new, uh, you know, wave of a globalization that can benefit all the countries. I'm going to abuse my position and ask you a very specific question, which I think is of interest to many people here. Is China going to carry on financing the Venezuelan government? <laughs> I, I'm not in a, in a position to say that, but, 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 I, think, <laughs> but I think, you know, it's, it's getting all the attention, of course. Yeah. Hmm? Sorry? Well, it's getting all the attention, of course. It's getting a lot of attention. It's, I, know it's not, I know you're not in charge uh, yet, but, but uh, do you have any comment on it? You mean no? the, 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 you're talking about the, uh, the, the local situation? Well, uh, you know, China has become the main source of finance for uh, the Venezuelan government, uh, and it's a government which is unpopular within Venezuela and unpopular within Latin America. And so it, it is getting a lot of attention for that reason. No? I'm, I'm not in the diplomatic uh, okay, fine. <laughs> okay. I did say I was abusing my position, so that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's an entirely reasonable answer. Yes. <laughs> so, thank you. Yeah. Um, Chris Olden, uh, um, the questions. Uh, sure. I just lost my mic as I turned. Okay. Uh, I thought I'd, th the, the first question, about how local, how, how the globalization is experienced and defined locally. Uh, and and I, I presume that this also reflects uh, uh, concerns, uh, the movement towards economic nationalism and these sort of identity-based politics. But I also would suggest that, that we're in a, that, that through technology, social media and the like, no one is localized. Everyone has some link. It can be, uh, it, it, it can be through the, through uh, production, global uh, value chains, their particular position within that, the, the global market, or uh, it can be in terms of their communication with others abroad, there can be diaspora links, but I think that, it's, that localization is not, doesn't mean the same thing today that it, that it has meant historically. 
And localization is always networked with a world that's out there. It may selectively shut that network out, aspects of that network out, but I think it is for us to understand localized responses of individuals, we have to take into account that they're framed within this other experience of, of uh, globalization that's not just material objects and whom they meet on the street. They meet online. They meet through all sorts of, uh, of media. Um, I'll say one compliment to the Brazilian uh, example and suggest uh, um, they used to say small is beautiful and maybe, uh, maybe Costa Rica